um, well, we came up with this idea at a board retreat uh, almost a year ago, and we decided we wanted to do some things that would help us create community in a way that didn't require an extra event, didn't require people coming out in an evening, and we thought, what if we just kind of converted a Sunday morning and made it a little different? Church, just kind of different, and we thought, what if we had food, because food always brings people together, you get conversation happening around uh, the tables, and and so uh, that's where Sunday brunch was born out of. And we thought, rather than doing, you know, your typical Sunday morning where we have like a package of worship and then you uh, have a, a preacher speak for a while, we do it a little differently and we would share stories. And so this morning we're going to hear a little bit of Stacy's story. And so I'm going to invite Stacy Weeb uh, to come up. And uh, Stacy is somebody that I've known for uh, quite a few years, actually. Um, uh, our connection goes back to the thriving metropolis of Carmen, Manitoba. Um, <laughs> Stacy was, uh, was briefly in the youth group that I led in Carmen because she's very, very young. Um, <laughs> And, uh, and there's no way that somebody as old as me could have been her youth pastor for yeah. very long. So, um, but I, I knew Stacy as a teenager, and then we kind of, uh, you know, we, we didn't stay all that connected when I moved on, and because she, again, is very, very young. Um, but we reconnected over the last couple of years, and, and hearing a bit of Stacy's story, sort of like what happened... Uh, in between, you know, being a kid in the youth group and ending up here at Grace was really fascinating to me. And there's been much that's happened in those days. And uh, Stacy is going to share a little bit about so, uh, what her life has been like. And so I guess to, to start, what I'd like to do is just ask you, Stacy, to just kind of share a bit of background. Like you, you grew up in Carmen, moved to Carmen when you were... Yeah, when I was in like grade or something okay. I moved to Carmen moved to Carmen when you were in grade four so most of your formative years teen years I grew up in Carmen that's yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah she's from Carmen kids um, <laughs> grew up in a church going family yes always went to church don't really remember when I asked like Jesus into my heart because it was just always always at church, always, a church. always involved you baptized me as a teenager with that, with a, a few other there was like 14 of us. It was some kind of major surge happening. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, Stacy and I met for coffee a couple a week ago, and she found a photo apparently of yeah. way back then, uh, and it's different. been destroyed. So you'll never get to see it. So. <laughs> um. So you're yeah you're living in this thriving metropolis. You're growing up. You yeah. you become a teenager. Uh, you're working at your family's. Okay, the, the, the greatest drive-in that you've ever been to was Buddy's Drive-In. Sadly, is not uh, not around anymore, at least not in the same iteration. And uh, I used to trade drum lessons for burgers um, with, uh, with uh, Stacy's parents uh, to tr uh, teach her brother Mike how to play drums. Uh, and you were working there, mm -hmm. and you met a boy there. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, my older brother's best friend. Your older brother's best friend. Yeah. Who um, then became more than just your older brother's... Yeah, I'm going to say he's a bit more than my older brother's best friend now. He's my husband. Okay. So, so um, yeah, uh, we started dating in my last year of high school. Okay. Um, and then I was in Brandon for a couple years, and we knew, like, within a month that we were going to get married. I so was still now in high this school. is where we kind of, like... Sort of lost yeah. touch ish. So yeah. I know you fell in love, you get married, and it's, mm -hmm. you live happily ever after. That's how the story goes. Yes. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Just except, easy peasy. Yeah. Except your first year of marriage. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about. We had just moved to Winnipeg, and I graduated from my web design course. And so I got a job working just not in the field. Um, and I got H1N1. H1N1? Yes, the high knee. Hmm. Yeah, so that was, I, we had only been in Winnipeg for a couple months, so I didn't have a family doctor, so trying to get in at that point, it was right when um, they weren't giving out vaccinations for the flu shot yet, or, and, um, but people were sick and going into the hospital and being like, 
going into the hospital, right? Mm-hmm. Like not just going to the doctor. Right. Say hi. Okay, so H1N1. Uh huh. I mean, perfect for a newlywed. Yeah, it's yeah, what you dream of after being married for three months. Yeah. Yeah, I could. Um, I probably should have been gone to the hospital, um, but I managed to have this kind of routine of um, I'd wake up, get sick, then I'd take my gravel or whatever eat a popsicle to have some sugar and that kind of it wasn't eating it was kind of slowly so that and then I'd go back to sleep until I had to do that again and it was like we were in an apartment so it was about five feet to the bathroom and I could barely make that by the end of it so you're sick for a while yeah and then some complications arise yeah so that was in November of 2009 and then in March of 2010 um, I was working in web design, kind of just sitting at a desk, not doing anything, and all of a sudden I'm in a huge amount of pain. So it's to describe it, it was like this really impossible tightness, but then also it feels like someone's jabbing your ribs with ice picks, and it wasn't my muscles, it was like felt like it was in the ribs, and it's like ribs, both sides, all the way around the back. So um, out of a they always rate pain out of 10. So kind of like one, whatever, and 10 is like the worst pain imaginable, like you're awful, right? Mm -hmm. Um, So I was regularly then at um, about a seven or an eight, which it would flare up to about a nine is what I would rate it. So it was pretty miserable. Um, So then still didn't have a family doctor. So we ended up going back to Carmen because we could get in there and I had history there from being a teenager. Um, And they were kind of like, hey, we'll put you on this pain medication. But it wasn't working. And then we tried some more, not working. Um, Ended up looking for someone in Winnipeg but hadn't found anyone. So they sent me to Morden because I thought someone that kind of dealt with pain that was there. So I was driving from Winnipeg out to Carmen Morden, so an hour and a half to go see, and um, still nothing. They sent me to specialists. Um, They didn't know what was going on. I remember leaving Morden crying for at least half an hour, like I just bawling, like kind of going like, why is this happening? I was 20 years old. Um, It was... um, it was pretty awful. I was just kind of in this place where I didn't know what was going on. So you've got undiagnosed, chronic, like it's... Constant. Like, yeah, it's constant pain. Yeah. Seven, eight, nine. Mm-hmm. And how long is that going on now while you're getting some... They're trying stuff. They're trying you're... stuff, yeah. And I ended up finding a doctor in Winnipeg who's like, okay, like, for the drugs, like... The drugs didn't take anything off. Like, I was on all the medications. Um, And she's like, hey, it might be in your head, but, you know, we'll figure this out. Um, So we were in... (laughs) She's like, well, like, it might be in your head. It's not like... She's like, I know you're feeling it. You're not crazy, but it's, like, neurological, right? Right. It's in your head, but it's not in your head. Right. Um, So we ended up having to go... It was... I feel like it was at least four years in, and I had tried like night naturopath. Yeah, did you catch that? F- four four years. Okay. Yeah, so Carry I on. wasn't working anymore. Thankfully, my husband ha- was working with hydro and was the biggest blessing, making me not feel like a burden. Um, and so we went like naturopath, neurologist, um, rheumatologist, you name it. I tried it: chiropractor, massage anything um and so we were getting ready to petition to try and get to Mayo Clinic Mm. um but then Manitoba Health was like well we want you to jump through some hoops here because they want to try everything so I had been to the pain management center which is at health sciences before and they're like well we want you to go back and try a couple more things they didn't they needed us to try a few more medications so I was on some drugs and got to the point where I, they were like, well, just keep on increasing it until it helps. I'm like, okay, I like to knit. I couldn't knit. Like, I had like 10 minutes after I took the drugs that I could kind of knit, and then it just wasn't working. And like, it was, it became that knitting was a 
therapy for me because it's kind of this meditation repeating and Mm. that was kind of my only sort of like break Mm. from the pain that I could mentally kind of separate myself Um, so we ended up doing that ended up being my mom and I were screaming crying like being like I can't the medication isn't helping like if I'm obviously being affected by it like if it we got to a dose that it could possibly help which we now know it probably wouldn't have Mm -hmm. um I'd be like a vegetable like I wouldn't be able to do anything Mm -hmm. function I can't knit I'd be able to just sit there so um I had the one doctor there said okay um let's try this thing called nerve root injections so they did with an x-ray guidance they're like okay we're gonna give you um i forget what the i was supposed to look up it's like a steroid kind of into my nerves so they were doing it in my back along my spine they're like okay we've got like six points we want to hit here so three on either side of your spine and i went into the room my mom's waiting for me in the other room because it's x-ray so it's not safe for her um so then all of a sudden they're doing it and my body just starts freaking out like my body is just i start crying involuntarily they're like are you okay i'm like i don't know like i'm crying but like it's that was the worst the pain has gotten like because they're actually getting like i could feel it against like my spine the needle going in so they did one or two and then they're like okay i can't do this to you anymore mm. like obviously your your body's saying no we can't do this so went out my mom was like are you okay i'm like i think so like <laughs> we're, we've got this like i'm okay now but my body is just kind of in shock um so we left it at two even though we we're supposed to do six and we're like kate okay, we'll see um and it was kind of like the next day or so and i was like okay well i'm still in pain like this hasn't helped but i kind of touched where um the pain was and it wasn't radiating anymore like kind of like the ripple effect like Mm -hmm. when you it wasn't like hurting after so i'm like okay well this is different and it had it brought it down any or were you still no it was still seven eight it was just it didn't get worse Mm -hmm. when i after i poked it um, so then that let the doctor know, they're like, okay, well, that's cool. It's probably your nerves have an issue. And then we're going to try this implant. So they decided to put in this battery pack in my back and two wires up my spine with electrodes in it. So it's like a TENS machine, which is like, you know, it's shooting electricity back and forth. So basically it was to try and confuse my brain because they're thinking, okay, well, if your brain's sending pain signals, then we want to stop that. So that was in 2014, 2014. Um, So that was in spring. We did a trial of it. So I had a week where it was an external battery and the wires going in, and I was like, oh, it actually brought it down a little. Hmm. So I was down to, like, a five or a four, so I could do more. Any superpowers? No. Okay. Thought maybe we could get Wi-Fi or something. Like right. working with tech people, they're like, "Can we uh, hack right. you?" Like, I don't know, maybe. Okay. Yeah. Um, pain's down though. That's good. Pain's down. So yeah. then I had a couple months where I couldn't have it, and then, and then we waited till the final surgery where they took a little, put the little implant in, and then so I had this, and we're like, "Okay, let's see how it goes." And I got back a bit of life. Um, my work that I was working for previously let me go back part-time they were really gracious with everything like the best ever and so I was working a bit and I was maintaining like a four or five and I could leave when I need to we flexed my hours and stuff Hmm. so you're paying now how many years are we in uh that's like four and a half so four and a half and now it's been brought down to a like a uh, level which Five. looking bad at it now back at it now I was in way more pain than I let on hmm. or like exhausted um, but yeah it let me I was still like I'm young I need to do stuff still so right. I was it was manageable to an extent right like if I was like I want to go out tonight okay let's sleep all day and then I can go out tonight right yeah, yeah you were telling me about the, the spoons yes so there's the um, the spoon theory. Um, it's for like chronic pain or issues. Because um, I had to do therapy before 
one th session of therapy before I got my implant because that's what they like to do. They like to make sure like you know what you're getting into. Um, so he says like chronic pain takes up 80% of your brain function. Um, and so the best thing is the spoon theory. And it's, um, say you start the day, and for each activity, most people have unlimited amount of spoons. They can do whatever. Um, when you have chronic pain, you might have a limited amount of spoons. So say you have 21 spoons. Okay, I'm getting out of bed. That's a spoon. I'm going to go to the bathroom. Another spoon. Shower, get dressed, you know, might take a few more spoons and whatever. And then, so then I would get to the point where I'd get up, get ready for the day, and I'd be ready to go at the door, and I was exhausted. I, like, I would crawl back in bed hmm. and just pass out and go to sleep because I had reached, I used my 21 spoons, like eating, making something for breakfast and stuff, might take up three or four, and before you know it, you're just out of spoons, mm -hmm. and that's all my energy, and then I had to go back to sleep, because that was my only break from pain, right. was that I could sleep with the aid of some like muscle relaxant stuff. Right, and so you've got, you've got a husband who's walking with you through this. Mm -hmm. You're finding it difficult to maintain friendships because... Mm -hmm. I felt like a burden because... So I had... Um, I've struggled with depression since a teenager, but it's always been something I could manage. But this kind of let me feel like... Like, I mean... F I mean, getting chronic pain at 20 made me feel, like, useless because everything that everyone else could do um, and I just couldn't do that anymore. Um, things that I know I should be able to do. Friends are having kids. Like, I, that was nothing. Um, my, I remember my mom once was coming in to Winnipeg to see me because I was feeling a little down. Jaden was working a lot. And I felt like I didn't want anyone to... No one wanted to be around me. Like, I was just um, annoying and had too much... I was needed too much attention for my pain, and meanwhile, my mom's driving in in blizzard, and I'm like, nobody cares about me. This is awful. It's horrible. But thankfully, I had my dogs. We had some massive dogs that um, would come and prance for me, mastiffs prancing, or the other one would lay her head on me, and they're kind of like they're my saving grace then, and kind of would pull me out of it and be like, no, like this is this is ridiculous, like I'm wanted and stuff. So um, I ended up getting a tattoo here just in white ink and it's a sparrow. So it's um, just to remind me like God is like no matter, even a sparrow doesn't worry for the next day. Like God has a plan for it. Like so much greater are you. Like, so that was always my, I would kind of see that and it's like, hey, like no, like there's something coming through this. Like, so I was always in this place, like, I'm like, God, where are we going? What are we doing? Why am I 20? And he's kind of like, no, like, um, I actually didn't tell you I was, when I was two and a half, I had homophilus B influ influenza B, hmm. and I almost died. I'm Portage's last case. Like, so I had pediatricians begging me. My, they told my parents, they're like, give her anything she wants, because this isn't great. And then the vaccine became there. So I'm like, okay, I made it through that. Like, obviously God has something here. Like, mm. something is happening. So during all of this, because we were just in Winnipeg, just moved to Winnipeg, and we wanted to stay with our family, like support and friends from Carmen, we were driving out to Carmen for church every Sunday for like I think like seven and a half years before we started coming here hmm. um, so that was a big support um, being on worship team God's always spoke to me through music so there would be a lot of times where I like I'd break down like with music and kind of like s seeing like okay like there's a plan for this like what's going on we're like okay like something's happening but life was working out, I was working a bit and stuff, and then um, we're praying, we're like, I'm like, all of a sudden I'm like, I kind of want to have a kid. I'm like, okay. That's, that's something. How's that going to work? Hmm. Um, I can't take care of myself some days. So um, we'd go out and I'd be like, okay, praying for things like, God, what's going on? And one day, I remember we were leaving, we were on the south perimeter going past um, the dump there. I mean, premise of the dump. It's a great story. Um, um, 
And I was just in this kind of down where it was nighttime. And I'm like, okay, like, what's going on? Like, I want a kid. I'm like, what do you have planned for this? And I was just praying, like, we were listening to music. And Jane's driving, and all of a sudden I'm like, Jane, did you see that? And he's like, yeah, like, there were these weird northern lights, but they were not to the north, they were kind of south. But there was this, it was right where we were both looking, and there was this moment of these northern lights where um, it was like, God, like, what is this? And God's just like, like, this is, I have a beautiful plan. Sorry, emotional. You're good. Um, I have this plan for you. I'm like, like, how is this going to work out with having a kid? Like, what is this? He's like, it's beautiful. Like, I can do anything. Watch. Like, you have to trust. So I told Jaden, I'm like, I was just praying. And he was like, okay, okay. So we started seriously talking about, like, okay, what do we need to do? The big thing for him, we had managed to buy, we bought a house on his, just his income. He's like, well, I'd like to build, like, that wasn't the house he'd wanted to have a kid in. I'm like, okay, let's do some budgeting, saving, and figure out what we need to do to build a house then, because I was really wanting a kid. It was like, I've never really been like, I'm going to be a mom kind of person. I've never been like huge into... Um, ba- I never babysat with kids, like because I had a job at my parents' restaurant. But um, so then, all s- for that to be all of a sudden, I was at like you know, like I'd be at, like a three or four. All of a sudden, like cranked this dial up to eleven. I was like ready to steal someone else's child. <laughs> I wanted a baby, and I'm like, this is a little weird. But like, I'm like Jaden, like I really, <laughs> really want a baby. Um, and so then we figured that out. We started. We built a house, and so. We, we managed everything through there, and then we're like, hey, like, let's try. And through this, my family t- told me after, like, that they planned that my sister was going to go down work days, and they were figuring out how they could have someone with me all the time, because they, they're like, she can't take care of a kid by herself. But everyone was super supportive. No one ever said, you can't do this. It was just them figuring out them figuring out how they could support me through this. So we tried for a bit, had a bit of trouble, and all of a sudden um, we found out we were pregnant. And so that was great, and we're kind of, at the same time, um, when we were trying, we were kind of thinking, okay, we want our kid to grow up in a place. We both grew up in the church. We want a church to feel like family. Um, driving to Carmen in winter with a kid that doesn't really work out, or even just to be able to, because we're in St. Patel, like to drive here, it doesn't seem as bad as driving to Carmen, which is an hour, but this is almost 30 minutes. So, um, so we started coming. We started going, trying a couple of churches, and then we found came to Grace. And I told Jaden, I'm like, as soon as I hear Scott preach, it's gonna pull me back into being the nostalgic days of being a teenager at youth. <laughs> So, and Jaden felt the same way, and we just felt like it felt like home. So, we started coming here. Um, I joined a great life group with a bunch of ladies, um, and um, there were a few of us having kids pregnant, and I let them know, like, my insecurities of, like, feeling like I'm not going to be a mo- a good mom, like... I'm like, I was terrified, like, what was happening. But every time I prayed with someone, every time, like, things, people are like, it's going to be okay. Like, we've got this. Mm -hmm. So we prepped for everything, and um, we were getting close to our due date. And I was like, okay, I'm going to feed the dogs, going to going to have one like have one last day of sleep before I need to start figuring everything out for this baby that was coming. This is in we're now in March of 2017. So it's been um 7 years of pain. 4 years with full, 7 uh, 3 with reduced. And so I was two and a half weeks out yet, so we're like, oh, great, perfect. Uh, no, he decided to come a little soon. Mm-hmm. Um, had to call Jaden and be like, hey, we, my water broke. We should probably, you know, 
install a car seat, pack a bag. He's like, okay, like, should I come home now? I'm like, well, yeah, we kind of, we did all the, the right things, so we knew that we had to go within a few hours. So I'm like, yeah, you should probably come home and we should pack things up, you know. So then we headed down and we felt really comfortable. Like, we just felt at peace through this whole, and neither of us, like, were like great. We were both the youngest, so we didn't have younger siblings. We were just like babysitting, so we're kind of a little unsure about the whole taking care of a kid. But we went to classes, and we just felt this peace. And we're like, okay, um, grab some subway on the way there because I needed to eat. Who knew this how long it would take? <laughs> Sandwich meat isn't deli meat's not going to hurt the baby. At that point, it's coming out. Like, right, yeah. like it'll the baby will come out before it gets to the baby. We're fine. Um, <laughs> uh, so we went and we had a beautiful baby boy, Grayson, and um, because of my um, implant in my back, they could. I had to meet with the doctors before um, to make sure, like if they could give me an epidural or what was kind of the plan. And it was basically there was, if one doctor was on, then they could possibly give me a spinal. Otherwise, if I needed a C-section, I would have been out and Jaden would have been on his own. So I'm pretty sure Jaden's pretty thankful that that wasn't the case, that he got handed a baby and just said, here, and then uh, left to his own devices. So we were in the hospital for a few days, had a little bit of feeding issues and I'm there and I'm like kind of like I feel funny and then um uh it was like kind of like oh like, like I, feel, I feel like my implant was a little strong so it kind of get buzzy so I turned it off I had this remote that I put on my back and I could control it and um I'm like oh this feels fine so I was like okay and then you know being a mom trying to to a newborn in the hospital trying to figure things out and I'm like I feel like I'm high like what's going on like and I'm like checking like they just I'm like I'm not on an IV anymore I didn't know what was going on I'm like it's been over 24 hours the medication they gave me for the childbirth and I'm like I'm not in pain um some I'll, like I felt, I felt like I was high, like there was this kind of release that I just didn't know. And it was, I wasn't in pain for the first time in seven years. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, miracle baby. Mm -hmm. Somehow reset, well we know how, um, yeah. reset whatever was going wrong in yeah. your body. Yeah, and so we Grayson never, is how old yeah. now? He will be three in a couple months. So. And you have had no pain. No pain in three years. No pain. That's pretty cool. Now, what's life been like for the last three years? Then, like. I mean, I have a toddler, um, <laughs> so it's been a little crazy. Um, but it's been it's been pretty beautiful. Um, it's been great to be a mom and a wife and feel like um, all the worries that I had about not being able to be anything for them it's gone he's my little reminder daily reminder that God's there for me um, and then also just a little challenging for myself now it's kind of like okay um I leaned on God so much during the, the hard times and like we're like we got that down um that now I'm kind of like okay like I need to make sure that we're still praising in the good like because there's like oh, you have struggles in your life like we had seven years of struggles and now like any struggles that just seem like nothing to it now hmm. Good. Thank yeah. you for sharing. This Thanks is quite a story. Um, I love that even even in the dark times, like you you felt like God still had a plan. And yeah. I, I don't know that that's everybody's story. I think. Some
sometimes we feel like we've been left alone or we've been forgotten or abandoned. And I think it's pretty cool that you felt that even there in that. There was one, um, I remember one sermon from when I was a teenager in Carmen. It was, um, anyway, we see things from the sidelines. Like if you imagine like a football game. I mean, it's football, Super Bowl today. That's well, perfect. Hey, look at you. Look at me. Did I preach the sermon or was this Glenn? This is Glenn. This is Glenn. Okay. Glenn. So, yeah, I'm like, sorry. I'm, I, you're not jogging my memory. No, so. no. Sorry. This is Glenn. Um, uh, so football, you see it from the sidelines. You kind of see what's going on. It's kind of a little messy, but you can kind of see things happening. But when you go up to um, the nosebleeds, or if you're sitting up high looking down and everything, you can see this play develop mm. and you can just see what's happening. And so that was in my mind. It's been in my mind since teenager and I know now why mm. I remember that. But it's like God's looking down. He knows what's happening. He can see the whole plan. He can see your whole life and see where this is leading you. Like this is where it's taking you. But And even though there's some like hiccups there, but it's going to work out. So that was kind of, yeah. Very cool. Very cool. Even when we don't see him, even when there's pain, even when there's darkness, uh, he promises not to leave us. And I, I want to thank you again, Stacy. I hope that Stacy's story has been an encouragement uh, to you this morning, that you could see God at work even in your own life, maybe in the midst of struggle, in the midst of pain, um, and maybe you only have a small promise to hang on to. Maybe, maybe this is one of those you know, extra things now that you're like, okay, God, like you, you did it for Stacy. You, you walked with Stacy. Will you continue to walk with me? And, um, as I was thinking about your story, I, I, I've been reminded oh, almost everybody who shares has something that they've already had to walk through or are in the midst of. And often when they come to chat with me, they're in the midst of something challenging and we've not been promised an easy life. Um, and whether we follow Jesus or not, it doesn't guarantee that life gets easier. Um, it, it, but it does remind me um, that, that, that it's, this is not the whole story. That, that what you're in right now, what chapter you're in, isn't the whole story. The, the seven years of pain, is a, it, when you're in the middle of it especially, is not the part of the story you want to stay in. But it's not the whole story. And I thought of the words of Jesus that he's explaining to his disciples that he's, he's about to be crucified, that he's, he's about to enter into a chapter that is going to be very painful and for them as well, that their leader is leaving, their, their teacher, their, their savior, their Lord is going away. And he's, he's telling them that I'm going to die and I'm going to be gone, but don't, don't worry. I'm going to prepare a place for you. Like th things are going to look different. You can't see it now, but it's going to be, it's going to be okay. And he says these words, he says, I told you these things so that in me, you may have peace in this world. You will have trouble, but take heart. I've overcome the world. And when I, when I think of these kind of moments where it's like, we will have trouble, we will have difficulty, but take heart. Jesus has overcome. And we may see overcoming in our lifetime. We may see it, thankfully, after the birth of a, a birth of a child. We may see it on the other side. But I hope that those words bring strength and, and encouragement to you today. We've, we've shared this story, and it's, it's so the way of Jesus to walk with people through their brokenness. And, and so whatever you're walking through, find other people to share your story with. Uh, be okay to lean on people. I know sometimes you feel like you would be a burden if you shared, but you don't know how your story might encourage somebody else or, or to have somebody else to walk alongside with you. And it's, it's not the end of your story. Whatever you're in, it's not the end of your story. Eternity awaits. And if you choose to follow Jesus, you will step into an eternity where all of those all that pain, all that sorrow, all of that stuff will be wiped away. And so I, I want to close kind of this portion of our brunch just with a word of prayer. I want to thank you guys for coming. Um, I, it, by no means are we kicking you out, but I, I'd like to just kind of close with a word of prayer right now, if that's cool. Father, we are so grateful for uh, your presence in, in this moment, in this place. I am thankful for, for Stacy and her story. I'm thankful for the way you have carried her and Jaden and Grayson. Lord, I am, I'm grateful for um, carrying them through uh, all of the pain, all of the despair, all of the frustration by giving them, even in the midst of that, uh, gentle reminders that you had not forsaken them.
that you, you still had a plan, that if they would continue to trust, that you would show yourself faithful. And, and Lord, I am, I am so grateful for um, the freedom that Stacy enjoys right now, that the healing in her body has been accomplished. And, and we know that that's the, your work. However it came to be, we know that it's you who's done it. And, and so we're thankful, Lord. And we, we do want to praise you now in, in the good times as well. And, and I want to pray for, for my friends who are here who, who are maybe in one of those two areas in their own lives. Maybe they've come through something difficult right now, or life is just kind of smooth sailing, and it's it's not really necessary, or they don't feel the need to call out to you. And Lord, I pray that today would be a reminder to be to be thankful for the blessings that are in our lives, for the health that we enjoy, for, for not being in chronic pain, for not having to manage some of those really difficult things. And if we're in those situations, Lord, help us to be people who look out for those who are and to be strength and hope and peace and, and bring uh, a measure of care into those situations where people are in pain. And for my friends who are today struggling, whose bodies are racked with pain, whose minds are filled with despair, who, who feel like they are a burden to the people around them, who feel like they don't have anyone to share with. Lord, I pray that today you first would be the one who would draw close to their hearts, that you would remind them that they are not alone, that they are beloved by you, that you see them just as they are. And, and just as Stacy said, you, you see the bigger picture and you will carry them through. And Lord, would you bring alongside people who would walk with and care for and be community around those people, that we would see healing and we would see deliverance and we would see people brought to wholeness. Lord, thank you that you walk with us, that, that, that Stacy's story is unique to her, but it's not, not unique to those who follow you, that when we trust in you, when we lean into you, we see you and we hear you and we, we, we know that you're at work. And so, Lord, would you, would you teach us to trust? Would you help us to walk faithful in the things that you call us to? Um, would you allow us to be, um, be people who walk in your ways because you've been so good to us? We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, I want to thank you for joining us for our second Sunday brunch or our second second breakfast. Um, if this was your first time to Grace, it's not like this every Sunday. We kind of wish it was, but it's a ton of work. Um, but thanks for being courageous. If this was your first time, it, it, takes a bit of, it takes a bit of oomph, a little bit of huspa to come out to something like this. And so uh, thanks. Uh, if you enjoyed this experience, we'd love to invite you back for next Sunday. There will be a little less food, but there's always coffee. Um, next week, we're going to be starting a series, just a short one, on tough words to swallow. We're going to be talking about some of those things that aren't all that popular to talk about anymore. And we're going to talk about words like repentance and righteousness and sin. What do they mean in 2020 if they still mean anything? Or are they like the inconceivable? You know, I don't think they mean what they think that means. And, and if you can't make it to next Sunday, or if you really like this Sunday and you want more, you can go back and watch Becca's story. Just go onto YouTube, type in Grace Community Church Winnipeg. You'll find all of our past sermons on there and you can find Becca's story which was the last testimony that was shared we'd love to do another one of these um, I have a couple other people who are already lined up who would be willing to share their stories I love the idea that it creates community uh, for everyone and so um, we'd love to do another one we're not sure when we'll make it happen again next but uh, thanks for uh, coming out parents if you have to collect your kids we're going to encourage you to do that in just a second but you're free to stick around for a bit more and have some coffee and uh, visit uh, with one another we don't really have anywhere else to be for the next little bit. We'll be cleaning up some dishes, and Super Bowl kickoff isn't until 5.30, and I heard the Raptors game doesn't start until 2, so you're good. Either way, um, remember, Safe Families, our info night is Thursday night here at 7 o'clock, and if we don't see you between now and then, allow me to pronounce this blessing over you. May the peace of the Lord Christ go with you wherever he may send you. May he guide you through the wilderness and protect you through the storm. May he bring you home rejoicing at the wonders he has shown you. May he bring you home rejoicing once again into our doors. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Have a great week, everybody.